Wow. This is such a blessing. This is such a blessing to my friends, my family, and my fraternity brothers here in the audience today. It is such a blessing to be speaking in front of all of you at one of the most prestigious universities in the country. It is such a blessing just to be standing in front of all of you here today. Because in reality, I should be dead. I've suffered from depression for many years. For those of you who know me, you may be thinking, bruh, I know you. You take a thousand selfies and post it on Instagram. You always look happy. You always got a smile on your face. But depression has many faces. Sometimes depression doesn't always look like crying or, or loneliness or sadness. The faces of depression can be masked through laughter, through smiles, or through excessive selfies. I was raised in Sydney, Australia. My family was from the lower middle class, and I went to a private school there. Now, private school in Australia is a little bit different from America. My private school was relatively poor. We lacked funding for supplies and uniforms. But in my private school, I was seen as different. I was brown, and I was American. Every day, there was a target on my back. And in Australia, you don't need to be African-American to be called the N-word. If you're simply of a darker complexion, or you're different, you will be called some kind of racial slur, and they will find a way to put you down. But it just wasn't students who called me these names. It was my teachers. My teachers saw me as inferior, as less than. Imagine going to a classroom and you're thinking, wow, not only do my peers not care about me, the person who's supposed to be my mentor, who's supposed to be guiding me through school, doesn't care about me. But it didn't end there. I felt trapped in school, but every weekend my family would take me to see my cousin. While my parents and his parents were having dinner, I'd be in his room, we'd be watching the WWF. If you don't know what that is, it's the World Wrestling Federation. And this was pre-UFC. We thought WWF was real. So I'd be in his room, and he would just beat me up. Suplex, power bombs, DDTs. He just killed me. And I was like, this is my family. I can't respond to this. I can't hit him back. I just took it. But I didn't cry to my parents because I ain't no snitch. But I just had to deal with it. Finally, I realized I had to toughen up. I'm sick of this. So I signed up for rugby. And my goal was to tackle the biggest dude on the team. I failed a lot. But finally, when I saw his face on the ground, I was like, yeah. We equal now. And it was cool. I felt for once in my life a little bit powerful. I felt for once in my life that I was equal amongst everybody. It was cool. And then my parents were in a car and they said, Matthew, we're going to America. And I was like, oh, are you kidding me, bro? I worked so hard to be equal to everybody. Now we got to go to America? I was afraid. I watched all of those high school movies, the jocks putting these nerds in locker rooms, or inside the locker, I should say. Even American Pie freaked me out. I was like, I don't know who this Stifler guy is, but I want none of that, man. <laughs> so I was like, all right, the same recipe that worked for me in Australia is going to work for me in America. I'm going to choose the most alpha sports and the most white sports that I could find. So I played football and I played lacrosse. <laughs> <laughs> and to be honest, I liked it. It was cool, man. I mean, no one saw me as less than. They just saw me as another teammate. Now, granted, I had no idea what I was doing, but hey, it was fun. But after high school, 
Sometimes memories are not erased that easily. Those feelings of feeling inferior never left. Those feelings of feeling less than. After high school, it didn't matter what color someone was. I felt like I was lower than everybody. When I looked myself in the mirror, I was ashamed of the way I looked. In fact, I hated the way I looked. I was thinking maybe if I was better looking, maybe if I was white with blonde hair, life would be so much easier for me. Maybe if I was more intelligent. I felt like a bad son because I didn't go to college right after high school. I felt like a bad friend because what value do I have for everybody? What could I offer the world? So I wanted to take my life. But then a voice inside my head said, nah, relax. Instead of me wanting to take my life, I wanted to take back my life. And it was powerful. But it wasn't through drinking green tea or taking in vitamin D or doing yoga classes. It was about the two things that I'm going to share with you. Number one, be grateful. We face a lot of pressure in society to be financially successful, to be popular on social media. But think about the people in your life right now. Think about those around you. You are already rich. You are already wealthy. A memory that comes to mind is when I was 10 years old. My parents took me to India. And we were at a train station, and I saw this kid who was roughly my age. All he had was a white t-shirt, cardboard box. I didn't see his parents. But he was smiling from ear to ear. I was like, what? I got rough, long clothes. I got a full tummy. Why is he happier than me? I feel like I want more, and he has nothing, and yet he feels like he has everything. To this day, I want to be like that kid. I want to be so content with what I have that even if you stripped away everything, I'm still smiling. And I urge all of you to be like that kid. Because it doesn't matter where you are in life. Look, all of you are doing something right, the fact that you're in this room. So just be happy with what you have. You are so wealthy, and people would die to be in your shoes. Number two, help someone. I am very proud of being a part of Georgetown and accomplishing writing a book and all that, but whatever. That doesn't matter. What I'm most proud of is helping a friend of mine, a friend of mine named Joe. Joe is a local homeless man who lives on Wisconsin Avenue. Last year, I saw him, and he's an artist. He has these nice little rocks, and, you know, it's kind of cool. He customizes these cool designs, and, but he wasn't making much money off this. I looked at his container, and he had about, like, three bucks. I was like, this is bull. I'm going to make you some money. So I had to break the rules, but... On Wednesday is Farmer's Market Day. Incredibly crowded at Georgetown. I secretly brought him in. Didn't steal a table, but I did take a table. I had his rocks laid on this table. And I asked students, hey, just Venmo 5 or $10. Make him some money for him and his dog. Students were so receptive that they gave an excess of 20 to $30. My man made over $200 within a three-hour duration. I was like, man, that's powerful. My man is also missing some teeth, but he gave me a perfect smile. That's priceless. I urge all of you, especially if you're going through depression, sometimes it's it's not even about you, man. If you go and help someone, you will forget about all that sadness. You will forget about those feelings of feeling inferior. Your focus is about helping someone. Maybe all of you have never been through depression. God bless your heart if you've never been through it. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. But if you haven't gone through depression, I urge you to go out. Reach out to someone who is going through a rough time. 
Reach out to someone who you think, oh, man, I haven't seen him happy lately. In 2012, I was alone in my apartment in Richmond. I had handwritten in cursive my suicide note. And I was about to walk out. I was like, I'm done. I'm out of here. All of a sudden, my phone was ringing. I looked at the phone, it said Johnny Lang. Johnny Lang at the time was a boyfriend to one of my closest friends, and they had just broken up. And he lives in a completely different state. He has no reason to call me. So I was like, what the? All right, let's see what happens. So I picked up the phone. He's like, Matt, I just want to say, like, if you're ever in town, let's go and grab some drinks, and I love you. I'm like, what? Why is, he, why is he telling me this now? It meant a lot to me. But I hung up the phone, and I was thinking, maybe someone tipped him off. Maybe this is all, like, too good to be true. So days later, I called him back. Like, you know what? I'm going to take you up on that. Let's, let's hang out. And we did. I drove to where he was, and we partied. And it was great, man. It was so great. But what was great was not the party itself. It was the people at the party. The people I met there, Casey Jones, Mary and Bobby Early, David Cooper, they're my family. He introduced me to a group of people that all of a sudden are there for me. In fact, before I came on stage, Casey sent me a text, I'm proud of you. Those words mean everything to me. But here's the thing, by him reaching out, he gave me something new. I may not be standing in front of you if he did not make that call. I could have tied that rope and it would be done. But by you reaching out, you also could be saving someone's life. And you may not even know it. So don't just go out and send an email and say, hey, I got your back or whatever. Actually go out and do it. Actually go out and be there for somebody. Throw them a party. Do something extra for them. Now, I'm not going to lie. I was nervous, not necessarily about speaking, but of sharing my emotions to everybody. I was nervous about that. Because I thought it would make me less of a man. And what kind of man just expresses his emotions like this? But you know what? That doesn't make anybody less of a man. What makes you a man is taking ownership of how you feel and doing something about it. If you want to hear something really embarrassing, back in the day, I would wear a suit for no reason. I would just walk around in a suit. And I did that because I was thinking, maybe one day I'll be somebody important. Well, that day is today. That moment is right now. So I want to say, I don't have a one-liner for you. I don't have something cliche to be like, all right, there you go. Achieve and believe you're good. Man, I don't know that. That ain't my style. But I do want to say one thing. Let us thank you. Thank you to all of you. Because in the heat of my depression, I actually envisioned maybe one day I'll have the opportunity to reach out. To reach out to that one person who has experienced what I have experienced. Maybe one day I can reach out to someone over there. Over there. And restructure their heart to give them some hope. This is truly a blessing. So I just want to say thank you to all of you. Because of you, I'm still alive today. Thank you.